Hi, my name is Eric Davis. Good afternoon. I work with the Harris County Public Defender's Office, which is in Houston, Texas. I am also the Felony Trial Division Chief uh, at the Harris County Public Defender's Office. I, I've served on staff of the Trial Lawyers College in Wyoming, where Jerry spent since 2005, and, and I, I'm happy to be here to talk to you about a subject that I think is essential for criminal defense lawyers, and that's cross-examination. And, and today, our topic is gonna be primarily cross-examination of difficult witnesses in sexual assault cases. Now, I like this quote from John Henry Wigmore, which is a quote that everybody sees the first part of it, that cross-examination is the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of the truth. I mean, I think all of us have heard that quote before. The second part of the quote is something that we don't always hear, and it says, you can do anything with a bayonet except sit on it. A lawyer can do anything with cross-examination if he is skillful enough not to impale his own cause upon it. And, you know, the, the picture he has is of a bayonet, which is this weapon. And it's how a lot of us view cross-examination, right? It's a weapon that we can use to cross up and confound witnesses, especially witnesses that are adverse to our client's cause. I mean, we can use cross-examination just to crush somebody else's case. And criminal defense lawyers are the only group of lawyers that, that have that ability to be able to defend their client using cross-examination, I think. Uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's a situation where, where it's just great cinema, great TV, and it'd be great if it happened in a courtroom. But I think it captures what Wigmore is talking about, right? Because he got to the truth through cross-examination. But if you look at what the judge, and you remember in, in Joe Pesci's the movie, My Cousin Vinny, the judge kind of represents truth. Because everything the judge does is at a point of truth. And the judge gets to a point where it says, I think you've made your point. You've made your point. That's enough. You've made your point. He's, he's hammering on the javel, saying that he's made his point. That's enough. But Joe Pesci, Joe Pesci presses on. And I think that's the idea lawyers have. They see cross-examination as the bayonet, and they want to kill or maim the witness. Because Joe goes further, and he's trying to kill the witness, right? He says, this is a magic grits. He could have stopped right there, and the jury was with him. They got the idea that this guy was wrong on the time. But because he pressed forward, I think the witness started seeming a little bit more kind of sympathetic, right? He seemed like a guy that was just mixed up after Joe got on him and kept pressing him. You know? And it looked like Joe was kind of hurting himself a little bit. And I think lawyers do that with cross-examination. We take it to a point where we try to kill or maim the witness because we're trying to put the witness in the grave right, on cross-examination, and we oftentimes hurt ourselves and we cause the cross-examination to become a wild ride, to become a wild ride. And this is what we want to talk about is effective cross-examination of difficult witnesses in sexual assault cases. I just wanted to add one more thing. Did you guys see that moment where Joe Pesci was like up in his face, like right up in the witness box? He had kind of lost control, right? Mm. There was this moment where he had kind of lost any sense of what was going on, and he was so intent on getting this guy to a place where he had already gotten him, he lost any sense of his own emotion. And we're gonna talk about that in a little while. It's okay. like Joe saw red, basically, right? You know, he saw blood in the water. Very good, very good. All right, so one of, some of the things, just to give you a highlight of where we're gonna go, we're gonna talk a little bit about the preparation of cross-examination. And then we're going to talk about different methods of cross-examination. Just give some, some examples of some different tools you can have in a toolbox. And then we'll talk about some special considerations in sex cases. So preparation and cross-examination. So before we, we get to the actual cross, right, you can't just cross in a case, right? You got to do a lot of stuff before that moment where you step into that courtroom and you stand up and begin your cross-examination. Right? You have to prepare. All the work happens in the thinking and the work involved in getting yourself there. So we're going to spend a little time talking to you about how to prepare to step into that moment of cross. All right. So, so I think in sexual assault cases, especially in involving cases um, that involve children and child sexual assault victims, that answering the question primarily is where I begin with my preparation. And that's why the child is saying what the child is saying when the child is saying it. If I can answer that question, I think oftentimes I'm halfway home. And I think it applies as applicable in, in adult sexual assault cases as well. 
So first, of course, in preparation is a thoroughly investigated case, which, depending on your jurisdiction, and I think in your jurisdiction, you may actually receive reports, and you may actually receive information prior to taking depositions and prior to the investigation of the case. So of course, first reading all reports and reviewing all evidence, getting an investigator to interview known witnesses, to find potential new witnesses, and to investigate witnesses that you know of, meaning be familiar with their testimony prior to taking a deposition, have your investigator actually talk to some of the witnesses before you have them on record, and then consult with experts, and then being familiar with the relevant law, the jury charges as well in the case, is a good point in terms of starting your investigation of a case. I just want to make a comment about the investigation piece. Um, it's something else we're going to come back to in terms of your tone when you approach the witness in the courtroom, which is really important in these kinds of cases. So when you guys send your investigators out on cases and you're going to take a statement from the complaining witness in a case, um, you send information to the investigator, you have a conversation, you say this is kind of what my defense is or this is where I think we're going with the case and I really want you to get a statement and try to get this information. Well, uh, one thought is to think about this. What may be more helpful to you or equally as helpful to you as the information you're going to get is understanding who this person is. Now, you guys are so lucky to have depositions, um, which we don't have in our jurisdiction. So as um, Lorinda was saying, like this is a gift from the heavens, um, the idea that you can either sign a piece of paper or file a motion or whatever you have to do to depose a witness in these cases, I'm having a hard time imagining why you wouldn't do that in every single case. Um, maybe some of you can tell me if there are circumstances where strategically you don't want to do that, but from where I sit in a place where we don't have that opportunity, you, you should do that. <laughs> um, it seems like uh, a no-brainer to me. Um, but if there are circumstances where you are not going to see the witness yourself and be able to get a sense of that person, when you send your investigator out to get a statement, um, you may also want that person to share with you the kinds of things that you would learn from meeting that person. Like, how does this person present? Right? What are the ways in which this person approached me, talked to me? Were they forthcoming? Um, this, this kind of things that you would get from demeanor. And you can get that information from your investigator, not in a written statement, which you may have to turn over. I don't know how that works here, but we have to disclose those statements if we obtain them, we're going to use them at trial. Um, but information that you can personally gain from, a, from talking with your investigator about the, the demeanor of that witness can be really helpful. Excellent. I started my career as a prosecutor in a jurisdiction where we had criminal depositions. And my last year as a prosecutor was assigned to a child sexual abuse unit. And so I got to see some lawyers take depositions. I don't know if any of you guys ever seen a movie, Murder on a Sunday Morning. Murder on a Sunday Morning. It was a, you, you saw it, the documentary with Pat McGinnis. I practiced in his jurisdiction and actually got to see him take depositions in child sexual abuse case. Pat McGinnis is a prosecutor, I'm sorry, is a defense lawyer who is fabulous. He is a phenomenal cross-examiner. And one of the things that they routinely did with the deposition was that they went into the deposition prepared. I've seen lawyers come into depositions and they're using the deposition as a, a means to prepare. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think you lose the opportunity if you don't prepare prior to the deposition. So you should have your investigator talk to witnesses before even going into the deposition so you can have an idea what the witness can say. So you can actually prepare your cross-examination. Now, the only disadvantage of taking depositions could be that if a witness becomes unavailable and you're stuck with the cross-examination from that particular deposition. Right? Because you've had the opportunity to cross-examine, you've had the opportunity to confront. So if they can show unavailability, you don't have a Sixth Amendment claim anymore, so you can't preclude them using the deposition. That's probably the only disadvantage of taking a deposition. So I think you should still use your common sense and be selective in taking the depositions that you want to take. But by all means, prepare prior to the deposition, because you can establish you know, enough information during the deposition to get an acquittal in a case, or to convince the prosecutor to dismiss the case if you go and prepare. So a lot of times, in fact, most of the time in cases involving kids, right, these cases are not really about what the allegations are in that room, in the bedroom where the alleged incident happened, or the course of conduct over the period of time. What it's about is what is going on in this family. 
right? What is going on in the situation in the family household that is leading this child to make a false claim of sexual abuse against your client? And these things can take time. I think one of the first cases that I ever worked on as a young lawyer, it took me months to really understand the dynamic in the family. You first start by trying to get at this from your client, and you can get a lot of stuff about these things from your client, but if you can get to other family members, people who are helpful to you that want to actually you know, talk with you, because you know, in family situations, there's always people on kind of both sides of these things, um, and start to begin to understand the dynamic of what's going on in the family, that's really where these cases are at. Um, the likelihood in cases that are false allegations of sexual abuse is that there's other things going on in the family. There's separation, there's divorce, there's a new kid coming into the household. There are reasons why the child may want to not be in that family situation anymore. And it is a mechanism for them to get out. Um, a lot of times in the cases that we have, um, kids are very familiar with the family court system, they're very familiar with the child protective system, and they understand that if they make such claims, this will bring forth some petition, and they will be placed outside of the home. And so what you're dealing with are just these enormously complicated dynamics in families, and your job is to really begin to understand what's going on in that family. And be patient and take the time to really understand it. Yeah. And I think that goes without saying in the sense of you getting additional ammunition for cross-examination. Um, as Karen was saying, if you've got a family that has multiple different issues and have had CPS contact, any family that's had CPS contact where there's a delayed outcry gives you additional ammunition for cross-examination in the case because that child has been interviewed and has been talked to by a CPS worker who's talked to him about touchings and there was an opportunity for them to disclose and they didn't disclose. So really getting into the family dynamics can help you find out other opportunities for the child to be able to disclose and get a full picture of the, of the story. So digging deeper is just sort of trying to find other ways to get at what's going on with the child in the case. So. Um, I think first, just thinking about talking with your client about other ways that you can try to get at what this child is like, what's going on with this kid. So are there other moments or places in this kid's life where they haven't told the truth, right? Are there other moments where they have had personal experiences where this is a kid who isn't truthful all the time? And what's going on there? Um, certainly, there, if you can subpoena records and get to those family court records. Um, as Eric just said, at least where, where I practice, the family court records are so much more detailed and have so much more information, um, you're gonna wanna do that. If you can try to uh, find out if there are psychiatric records that you can subpoena, um, you can try to ask the court to do an in-camera in inspection and see if you can get at what's going on with the kid. Similar with um, school records. Now, if your, your client is the parent, you may be able to have greater access to get records, school records, um, because your if your client's the parent, then they have the rights to get those records from a school. So it's like really pushing out and thinking more broadly about how to get at what's going on in that relationship and with this particular child. All right, so more on thoroughly investigating the case, of course, is investigating the character of the accused. In this modern day and age with social media, there's information available about the character of the accused, be it a child or be it an adult. And then, of course, speak to the accused's friends and family members. Sounds kind of counterintuitive. If you're able to get a, a child's uh, school records, you can find out some, some teachers who may have taught the kid, who may have had some interaction with the kid. If it's a cash class she's been failing in, that teacher may have an opinion about the child's truthfulness and could be a potential witness that you could use. You know, obtain school records and work records if it's an adult. Um, oftentimes, you can get information that goes to the truth of the complainant or the truth of the accuser by doing a little investigation. We also don't want to forget about text messages. Um, you certainly want to ask your client about whether there's been any texting between um, him and the accuser. And um, I don't know if you guys have controlled calls. Do you have cases with controlled calls in your jurisdiction? Where the police set up a call where the um, complaining witness is put on the phone, tries to make a phone call to your client and get them engaged in a conversation that they're recording. Do you guys do that? No? 
good <laughs> if you're lucky, because that happens a lot in our cases. So just always asking things like, have you had communication with the complaining witness on any kind of texting, face, Facebook, messengering, any of those things, because you want to know if that's out there. Um, and also if, uh, phone calls or any kind of phone call was made in which they were being, having a conversation about the allegations. All right, and I think we talked about that. So this kind of goes back to what Lorinda was talking about earlier, which is if you have a kid who is alleging sexual assault, um, you want to make sure or at least determine whether or not there is a reason or a mechanism by which the child actually knows about the subject matter that they are talking about in the accusation. So again, if the child is alleging um, touching or um, anal penetration, like you have to figure out how would this child know this if this didn't actually happen. Um, so you wanna try and get at what's going on in the household, right? Like are there, you know, do you and your, you can ask your client whether you and uh, your spouse watch pornography, or do you watch, what kind of movies do you guys watch at home? And does the kid have access to a computer? And what kinds of things um, does she talk with um, about her friends if the kid's a little bit older, right? Um, and kids that are you know, teenagers now, I think that's not nearly as much of an issue. Um, but for kids under, let's say, 10 or 9, I think you want to see if you can get at how they might have the knowledge or the ability to actually share that information. Um, and you'd be surprised the things that kids listen to and overhear in their households too, right? So you want to get at what's going on in the household. Is there an older kid who that young person is spending time with, another sibling, right? Really explore that. Um, and the other thing, as I said before, I don't know if this is applicable in your jurisdiction, but if this is about a desire to get out of the household, and part of your theory is that the child is saying these things because she wants out, and she, the access to doing that is making a report, you're gonna have to tie those pieces together that this child knows that if she makes this report, that could happen, right? Um, and so you wanna be able to at least pull those pieces together that perhaps the child is in their family has previously had contact with Child Protective Services or somebody else in their family did or that the kid is aware or knows somebody who's been through that process. Again, something I think you can get from your client. And, and I think source of knowledge is important um, as well as what is the knowledge of the facts. For example, in depositions, I've often seen um, where people would ask the complainant to describe the genitalia. Right? A child might make an allegation that a person made them perform oral sex over a period of five or six uh, months, and they performed oral sex on this person over five or six months. We'll put chocolate on a penis and lick the chocolate off the penis. And they give these details about what occurred, but couldn't describe the genitalia which is an issue with what the child knows. Now definitely the source of the knowledge is, is an issue that you definitely want to go through to help you explain the theory of the defense. How does your child know to say that? If you've got a five-year-old child, there's a big question on how they know anything sexual. How do they know about white stuff coming out of the penis? Those are different contextual things that the prosecutor will argue goes to the veracity of the complainant. And so it's very important to try to explain the source of the knowledge. But in the case itself, I think it's also important, especially given that you have a deposition, to probe the lack of knowledge. Now, I'm not sure, the jurisdiction I practice in, that whenever a child was deposed, you had, it had to be video recorded. It had to be a videotaped deposition, um, and, and in some cases, you know, the defendant couldn't be present. He could be present at every, every other deposition, but not at the deposition of the child. I don't know if your jurisdiction has the same thing, that the depositions of children, if you take them, have to be recorded. That isn't the law? Wow, that's pretty good. All right. So um, capturing the space. So this is just sort of an idea of thinking about where did, did these alleged acts take, take place. So um, if you can go and see the space, if this happens in an apartment and you can get access, go. If you're going to send an investigator and they get access and that's it, They're, you're never going to get in that house or that apartment again, have them take pictures, maybe do a video. Why does this matter? Um, one of the first cases that I tried as a young lawyer, um, I had not been to the house and had been hearing, learning about this case. It was a, a transfer from another lawyer. Um, and I had this whole picture in my head of what this house and, a, and the space looked like. 
And we finally went to the house and everything about the case changed for me. My client's room where these alleged um, repetitive acts of violent sexual assault were taking place happened in his room, allegedly, which was literally the space right next to the living room. <laughs> and it was um, a pretty big space for an apartment um, that in the Bronx. And it was so, it, it became so clear to me the minute I stepped into this room is that there was no way that that was happening in that room where, they, where it was located in that house. And it completely changed everything. Um, little things, like if you go into an apartment and the apartment's really small, like stand in one room and have your investigator stand in the other room and talk and see if you can hear what's going on in that other, in that other room. Right? I mean, if the allegations are that there are a whole bunch of people living in a relatively small space, um, or people are sharing a bedroom, which happens a lot, um, how could that possibly have gone on if, in fact, it occurred in this place? So this can be really important. Um, this is an obvious point. You want to really explore the nature of the relationship not just between the family members in these cases, but between your client and this child. Um, is, there, is this a stepfather who's stepping into the family and is imposing rules in the household that have never been imposed on this child before? Um, how often do they spend time together? How often are they alone together? What are those circumstances? Right, because these things don't happen, you know, in a living room through a whole bunch of, in front of a whole bunch of people. So your client's access to this child, how often they are alone, all those things are really important. Um, and what the dynamic is, and how they get along, um, and you really want to explore that in quite a bit of detail. Yeah, and I think you want to explore it with your client as well as with all witnesses, other witnesses you come in contact with. You might be deposing a witness that knows a client and a child. It'd be important to know what their perception of their relationship was as well. You want, I'd try to explore it in every context I could in terms of every different witness that they could. I mean, if you had a child who had actually spoken out or, or said some negative things about the client to a teacher or to, to a, a, a peer or another student, those could all be things that could be relevant. In fact, the observing person, this sort of right, objective person's perceptions of that relationship is, is more important in some ways than anything else. Because if a family member is observing and watching the dynamic between these two people, and it is literally something they've never noticed that there was, there was any even kind of connection between these people. They never even sat in the same room together or anything like that. Like That can be so helpful to you. So the moment of when the child reports this, these events to a person um, of importance that triggers this, the reporting of the case, the outcry, um, which of course that's like a prosecutor word, right? I don't even know why we ever use that. I, anytime I use this slide, I'm like, I should change that slide. Um, because really it should say the first time she actually allege this falsity, right? Like whatever, it's like, it's not an outcry because that's the prosecutor's word. But anyway, what, when, is, when does that moment happen? What are the circumstances under which that happened? What are the surrounding circumstances to it? So for example, we had a case where a child made um, this claim of sexual assault and it turned out that the same day at school, they had a puppet show. And the puppet show was um, about reporting sexual assault. And at the end of the puppet show, the uh, performers had the kids come up if they all wanted to share information about uh, or ask any questions. And like a whole line of kids um, came up to the front to talk to the people about uh, the, their own experiences. Um, we had another case where uh, kids were asked to write a story about some traumatic event in their life. Um, and the teacher had shared with the kids um, something about a prior sexual assault in her life. And this was the favorite teacher of this child. Wow. Um, there are just all kinds of crazy stories. Interestingly, in the case with the puppet show, we actually had our investigator go to the puppet show at a different school <laughs> and watch it and see the content and find out what, what it was actually about, which was really interesting. Um, so in, 
there's always something, right? There's some reason that this kid is saying this thing. Now, you know, obviously there are times when a kid is saying it for a reason, which is like, let's say it's true, and they're sharing it, but they're still reporting it because something has happened that has caused that child to share this information. And that can become a mechanism by which you can start to explain why this kid is saying this thing that isn't true in your theory, um, right, for the first time ever, right? Why is it coming out today? And you just need to understand that. Again, this sometimes these things are really hard to figure out, right? Because your client obviously has no idea. So you have to get at that information in other ways. You have to really dig at the discovery. Um, in my jurisdiction, we get this stuff so late in the process, it's really frustrating. So we're trying, and we don't have depositions. So we're really forced to try to get out there and figure this stuff out in other ways to figure out how this event got reported. In, in outcry, I'm mainly trying to pin it down, basically, trying to pin, it, pin down when is the outcry. In other words, when is the first time the child actually said something or made an allegation of sexual abuse, or, or an adult for that matter? When was the first allegation? My goal in the investigation of investigating the outcry, for the most part, is trying to pin it down. In, in Texas, we have, uh, we have a, a, a statutory um, mechanism where we can request notice of outcry to sort of lock the prosecution. <coughs> excuse me, into a specific date and time and incidents when the outcry occurred. And it is very helpful. When we, and the, the, the state bar we went and we, we, we advocated, at least the criminal defense bar, advocated for that to be added because in the defense of the cases, especially in delayed outcry, it's essential to know what that date is. Why do you want to lock that date in? Because it gives you issues of when there were other opportunities for the child to disclose. If a child comes in and makes a disclosure at, at 11 years old for an abuse that happened at the age of seven, and then she went to the doctor and saw a gynecologist and everything before then, she's had all of these different opportunities to talk about sexual abuse, and she have, hasn't, then it casts some doubt on what the child is saying. So usually when I'm investigating an outcry in a case, I'm usually trying to pin the date down, trying to find the exact date when it occurred so I can compare and contrast other opportunities that the child may have had to make a disclosure prior to that. If she had CPS contact. When she's going to school every year, they have, have a talk at school every year about inappropriate touchings. So she's had three years in school where there's been talks about inappropriate touchings and said, said nothing. When, when her parents went through different issues, it helps me pin that down so I can answer the ultimate question that Karen is saying, why is the child saying what the child is saying now? She didn't say it before because then she wasn't in trouble in school. She didn't say it before because her dad didn't take a cell phone. You follow me? We're, we're looking at that outcry as, as a way of tracking when the child had the opportunities to disclose to someone else. And so she didn't disclose then, but she disclosed it now, not because it happened, but because of the alternative motive, the reason why she's making a disclosure now. I, the, the idea that you guys were able to get that um, as your, your bar, as a, to get that as sort of information that you are entitled to, that's amazing. I was just thinking that maybe, I don't know if you guys have a demand for discovery and file for a bill of particulars, do you guys have that? No? Um, but maybe you could um, just file a request for that information if you're not given it, meaning um, if there's a, in your motion practice or if you're demanding information, you can add that as a thing. Because I was just thinking, because we do, um, we file a, a request for a bill of particulars where you're actually requesting that the prosecution set forth exactly what they're saying happened and how they're going to prove each element. Not that they do a great job of responding to them, but we do file these in every case. And we could just add in an extra line in there where we're saying we're requesting not just about the allegations and the, the time and place of the occurrence, but also about the outcry. So try to be creative, I guess is my point, which is if you think that it is something that is so important to understand and know, because it's going to play into your explanation for why this child is making this up, you need to know the information. In our jurisdiction, you're able to even have a hearing, right? You can request it, and you're entitled to a hearing on the outcry, where you can litigate the outcry. That doesn't help you, but what does help you is the theory behind it. The theory behind it is that this is pretty much a, a hearsay statement. It is a hearsay statement. There's some ex exceptions to it as a hearsay statement. But the underlying issue is that the defendant has a Sixth Amendment right to confront. So if you offer, and oftentimes, you know, outcry statements are offered before the accused testifies. 
right? They'll have someone come in and they'll give this. This is the outcry. This is what the outcry was. There's still a Sixth Amendment challenge that you have. So one of the things you can do whenever there's outcry, you can object and challenge it under the Sixth Amendment and argue reliability and issues of reliability. This isn't the first time the child said it. This is maybe the second or third time she may have said it. And there's a situation where this may not be as reliable as an initial outcry, initial presence and impression, and you have a Sixth Amendment challenge. So I think every time you see an outcry, if I were in your jurisdiction, I'd try to raise a Sixth Amendment challenge as well. So, um, you know, when, we, when Eric started kind of listing all the things you want to do to kind of investigate your case, he said, go through your paperwork, go through your discovery. And Lorinda talked about making an outline or a timeline, which to me is probably the most important thing that I do for my prep is make a timeline in every single case. Um, it helps you prepare for pretrial hearings, and it helps you understand how every single event falls into place together, and who the person is that's receiving that information so you can source the information that's in your timeline. And it kind of helps with just your whole processing of the case. The thing that I always find so amazing about this reading over discovery is that, and I'm sure you, you all do too, um, but I'm just saying it to say it, which is at, as you read through your discovery materials, you are processing everything that is being shared with you. When you get to the end of reading that, Right? Let's say you have 100 pages of discovery. When you get to page 100, you now understand the case differently than when you started reading it, right? So if you go back to the beginning and you read it through again, you are now rereading this thing with an understanding of the whole picture. So some fact, kind of like Lorenda was saying, it's like a little fact in there that didn't really seem to matter that much when you read it the first time, now may seem like such an important fact because it's relating back to something else that you've now learned later on in your processing. I mean, I read discovery over and over and over again. And there are times when I'm like, I feel like I know the case so amazingly well, but I get like worried that maybe I'm missing like a little thing. And right before I get up to cross-examine, I will read through every single one, every single statement of that witness again. And almost every time when I do that, I like miss a little thing. And I think it's this, this a, a process of digesting the information in the frame of what you now know and understand about the case. So a lot of these, especially the kid cases, right, if this is a report um, in which there is a delay in the report, um, as Joe was talking about, which happens almost all the time in these cases, um, not always, but often, um, from the moment when this event took place until the reporting of this case, some time period has gone by, right? So a lot of times there isn't physical evidence in the case, right? There isn't DNA, there isn't a ripped um, shirt, there isn't a sane examination, there isn't a medical record, there isn't physical evidence, right? And these cases come down to the word of the child. That's what these cases often are. So you want to think about if there, this event took place, what evidence would you expect to see? And you really want to think that through from start to finish, whether it's witnesses, um, people who heard things, people who noticed things, physical evidence that could exist, um, sheets that could have been taken, um, whatever it is. And because that lack of evidence, the things that should have been there but were never brought forth is a great place for you to start to create some arguments for yourself later on. And I think that's like essential in cross-examination. A lot of times you will have prosecution witnesses that will try to explain away the absence of evidence, but in talking to jurors after trials, uh, I find that most of the jurors still hold their beliefs. For example, if you've got an a eight-year-old child who's, who's alleging penile vaginal intercourse that occurred over a three-year period of time and her hymen is still intact, a lot of jurors still hold on to that. Irrespective of the same nurse coming in and saying, well, you know, I wouldn't expect to see a hymen intact. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a mucosal situation where everything's going to heal. A lot of jurors still have that in their mind. And so I think it's still fertile ground to talk about and explore the lack of evidence. Even if there may be an explanation from the prosecution, jurors still hold their beliefs that there should be something. Her hymen should be broken, right, is what a lot of jurors think. And so they have issues with that. So I think the lack of evidence is important as well.
Great to talk about this. And then in depositions, <laughs> I, I think you should, of course, there's some people who believe that you should take every deposition you can. I don't agree with that. I think you should only take depositions of all the key witnesses and only take depositions when you're ready. Don't take depositions at the beginning of your investigation in a case. I see it happen all the time. Lawyers who take depositions or have this gift of depositions, they ignore the rest of the investigation of the case and rely solely on the deposition to develop their investigation in the case. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's error to do that. I think you've got to investigate, investigate the case prior to taking depositions. When I was a prosecutor, we tried to get the defense to take depositions before they were ready. We try to get them to take depositions before they finish the case, because you can't redepose a witness, usually. In your jurisdiction, are you able to redepose a witness? If there's nothing factually that changes, you get one shot at the deposition. So if you can get a lawyer to take a deposition when he's not ready, when he hasn't investigated the case, when he hasn't found all the different issues associated with a witness, he's at a disadvantage. He's at a disadvantage. So if you're going to take deposition, which is key, I think, in terms of preparing for cross-examination, having a good deposition. A bad deposition for cross-examination is, is, is the same as not having a deposition. So take depositions of key witnesses and only when you're ready. I have a really, really good idea. Pretend you're me. And you're in a jurisdiction where you don't get to do that. Pretend that you can't depose anybody in the case. Figure out how to prep your case and use all kinds of other mechanisms to investigate your case so that when you, when you actually step into the deposition, you are prepared and you have a strategy, right? Because what Eric said before, of course I had never thought of because we don't have depositions, but you could end up with a transcript with all kinds of terrible stuff in there where you asked all kinds of questions that's coming into trial because all of a sudden that witness is unavailable. So you want to strategically be really clear about what it is that you are asking and your purpose for the deposition, right? It may be that you're trying to just get a great plea and you're just trying to like really go after this witness to point out a lot of the holes in the case, but your ultimate goal is that you're trying to get a really good disposition in your case. I don't know, right? Every case is different. But if you prep the case and do everything you can before you step into that room, so in a lot of ways you're preparing to depose, maybe that's an interesting way to think about how to use this tool. Absolutely. Have, have any of you seen prosecutors let cases go after the deposition? Happens all the time, right? If, if a witness testifies terribly at a deposition, things come out, because most prosecutors don't really know their cases. They learn them during depositions. A lot of them learn their cases during the depositions. So you've got to take that as it's a great tool that you have. I wish, where I practice now in Texas, we don't have depositions. I wish we did. All right, some other unique considerations. You want to go on this one? Yeah. You can, I think, switch. We'll go to the next one. Yeah. So um, we were talking before about the outcry piece, right? And Eric raised the issue about um, kids having opportunities to share information about these allegations with other people, right? And since there's so often a delay in the cases with kids, you kind of want to ask yourself, what's going on in this circumstance that the child did not tell? Um, and this relates a lot to Joe's presentation, because at least in New York, where sex abuse accommodation syndrome is admissible and comes in on a direct case by the prosecution, not like here, which is as rebuttal, um, we have to be thinking about like the delay in the report and how it is that they're going to now explain this, right? And so I'm always thinking about if this event happened, who would the child have naturally told? Who are the people in this child's life that they would have shared this information with? Um, and so I always like to think about, like, are there other women in this person's life, like an aunt or a sister or other women who, if it's a female child, they would be more likely or most likely to go to and talk to? How about a teacher, a guidance counselor? The doctor issue is really interesting, too. Um, I have a daughter, and she's 20 now, but at a certain point in her life at the pediatrician's office, they would ask me to step out of the room, and they would have a conversation with her and ask her whether anybody had been touching her inappropriately. And I remember when that started happening. These are questions that are commonly asked of a female child at a certain point in their life. 
Um, and even the idea that a child who's been going to the same pediatrician pro possibly for their entire life and is, has an opportunity in a closed setting to talk about how she's doing and what's going on and doesn't report that repeatedly, particularly if asked, that's kind of fertile ground for cross-examination. So the idea of thinking through who would this child naturally have talked to if this really happened is an interesting area for you to explore. And then the issue about how the child is questioned in the first instance is really important, because you all know that correct forensic examinations, interviews, the way they're, they're taking place is if it's done correctly, their leading questions are not used, right? They have to ask open-ended questions. Um, you cannot suggest in any way the answer to the question to the child. Children are more susceptible to that kind of leading than adults are. So that's what any forensic examiner will tell you. Um, how do you think these kinds of conversations go between a kid and a mom? Do you think the mom asks open-ended questions? Do they say things like, can you tell me in your own words what happened? <laughs> right? It's like, did he touch you? Right? Like, isn't that what the question is? Did he do something to you? Did he put his hands on you? Did he put his fingers in you? Did he touch your breasts? Like, that's what's going to happen. And not that that is a wrong thing for a parent to ask, but when it comes to suggestiveness and the way that a proper in investigation should take place, it's exactly the opposite of the way these things should take place if you're really trying to get the child to share true and accurate information. So if you can get at the mechanism by which the questioning took place, um, which sometimes is very specifically in the um, Child Protective Services reports. Um, it's less so in our discovery, um, but if there is a way for you to get at maybe talking to the mother or the witness or the outcry witness in an investigation, it can be really helpful for your formulation of your theory and also for cross-examination of that witness. And I think it's a good point or a good issue to consult with an expert on as well. If you have an expert in child development or child psychology who, or child sexual abuse, there's some experts who actually work with and train CPS people who will serve as an expert in your case and talk about the, the need or the imperative for, for open-ended questions and, and forensic examinations. Yes, sir. Actually, I've used a couple of experts, a couple of different experts that talk about that. They actually call it, they say that the witness is actually tainted through the interview. Every time a witness is interviewed, there's some experts that'll say, every time a witness is interviewed, they gain extra information from the interview. And if you get an interviewer who's not skilled, because some interviewers will provide information, right? Like she's saying, a mother comes in, so did he touch you? So now the word touch is introduced, right? And say, did he put his finger on you? Did he touch your vagina? So now all of this information is being introduced to the child, and if they latch onto it, they may develop a narrative from the interview getting little pieces of the interview and develop a narrative that's false, right? That's a false narrative. And they may believe it over time, depending on the age of the child. And there are tons of experts who, who actually have, have published on this subject and who are willing to come to court and testify on it. I don't know how you guys feel about using experts in these cases. I almost always use an expert in these cases. To have an expert at least review it, to go and look at the interview, the initial sane interview of the child. We call it a CAC interview. We have something called the Child Assessment Center where I practice, where whenever there's an allegation of abuse, the child is taken for a forensic interview, right? And so an expert will look at the forensic interview, which is video recorded in our jurisdiction, and will give you opinions about the technique used by the forensic interviewer to see if those issues are present. You follow me? And then even aside from that, however many times the child's talked to, if the child's talked to by the police, which they're not supposed to talk to them, but a lot of times police officers will get there and they'll interview the child at the scene. If the mother interviewed the child, if, if a school counsel interviewed the child, if you've got all these different interviews, especially if they haven't been recorded, it gives an expert a whole lot of latitude to suggest some reasonable doubt. Does that answer your question? All right. There are also uh, two things. One is, um, you know, Joe talked about like the horrific nature of having all these, these sex abuse accommodation syndrome experts come in and testify. But sometimes you can use these people to help you um, because we get uh, these folks come and testify. And if this is an issue in your case, right, you can get 
that usually these people are trained in forensic interviewing, and they can help you get that information out. The last trial where we had, actually, Eileen Tracy, who is a sex abuse accommodation syndrome expert who testified in the original case uh, in New Jersey, in the daycare cases, um, and was one of the bases for why that case got overturned, was her techniques. She actually now writes about proper technique, and what happened in, the, in our case was sort of this blatant suggestiveness of questioning. And we were able to use her to explain why that questioning was totally improper and planted false information in the kids' minds. They also do, um, in, in our jurisdiction, a, um, one, this, a single interview where they have the police officer asking questions to the witness and the prosecutor's watching, the family court lawyer's watching behind a screen, and they do all of this to try to minimize the amount of time that the kid has to tell the story, right? And so probably most sex crimes detectives will tell you that that's why they do that, because the more times the kid has to repeat the story, at the, they share information with the child, and that information can get implanted in their minds. The thing is, is that that isn't ever the only interview that happens, right? They are interviewed repeatedly, and it's set up and designed that way, but the reality is they end up having to tell the story over and over and over again, um, and they're exposed to that kind of um, questioning. Yeah. All right, and then develop your theory of the defense. And generally, from the investigation of the case, things that might come up from your review of the relevant law, and from consulting with expert witnesses, up back, and from consulting with expert witnesses, the different things that you can do. During the course of your investigation of the case, you begin to develop your theory of the case. After taking depositions, collecting all the information, you look at the relevant law, consult with your experts, and develop your theory of the defense. So this, actually, this point kind of uh, gets to the questioner's last question, which is, you know, usually when the kid cases, the theory will fall into these three categories. One is the child has come to believe that this event happened and has been influenced by others to make these allegations. Um, and we even, you know, Eric's going to do a, a lecture tomorrow on voir dire. Mm -hmm. um, but if that is the theme of your case on voir dire, um, we have talked about this in jury selection and sometimes opened on it, which is the idea that we all have memories. And almost everybody in my office uses my example because this is actually a true thing. Like, I have a memory, a picture memory in my head of the day that I was brought home from the hospital. I, I, I kid you not. Like, I could describe it for you. My parents drove up the driveway. Is that me me. It's you. You're making noise. Um, to my house, my brothers were standing at the top of the driveway with my grandmother, and my older brother was in his pajamas. And this is before it was cool to wear pajamas outside. <laughs> um, but like my mother was horrified. Here I am coming home from the hospital. I'm a newborn. But she's worried about my brother being on the driveway in his pajamas because <laughs> she was embarrassed. And I have this whole picture in my head of this story. But of course, I was in the car with my parents as a newborn. So I didn't see that, right? Why do I know that? That story has been told to me over and over and over again. And I could swear that I could see that in my head. And almost everybody has that experience. So I like to use a story like that sometimes on jury selection, and maybe even an opening to sort of sell this theory and this theme in the case. Um, anyway, that's a little side. So the, the second kind of version of your theory is the child knows this is a false, a false allegation. She's testifying about it intentionally to hurt your client. Um, and then there's always this, which I've never had this, actually, <laughs> as a defense. But the child was assaulted by someone, just not your client. And there's motive for her to blame uh, your client. And that may be a cir circumstance where there is physical injury in a case, and you really can't get around the fact that the injury must have been caused by sexual abuse, and you got no other choice um, other than to try to blame someone else. But then, of course, we end up with DNA, so you probably take a plea. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but those are really, really difficult cases, obviously. Um, so, so theory sort of falls into those categories. And this is an example. Is that what's next? 
the example uh, of the theory? Just to answer. Oh, the go question. ahead. Yeah. Yes. It, these these kind of go back to that same question was why the child is saying what the child is saying. It's some theories that you can use to sort of you know answer that question, the ultimate question in the case. And, and I think your theory also needs to incorporate this, right? Like why is the child saying what they're saying and why are they saying it now? Um, we threw this little slide in about rape shield because it's like important for you to understand when and how you may be able to incorporate a prior allegation of sexual conduct of a complainant. I understand that it's pretty limited, although there is a catch-all that you can, if you can make an argument and persuade the court that it would deny your client a constitutional right, like a right to present a defense to not um, incorporate that. Um, you can try to persuade a court that it's, it's admissible. Um, but you want to make sure you understand whether that's coming in when you understand and write the theory of your case. And physical evidence as well is the only other time as well you might be able to use uh, some evidence of, of other sexual activity of a complainant. If there is some injury, for example, if a hymen is broken and they're alleging your client did it and she's been sexually active, that might be an explanation as to why the hymen might be broken, which could be something you may want to consider in cross-examination if there are injuries. So this is a theory from a case that we had in our office. I just wanted to throw up a theory so you can hear it. Um, I like to write my theories the way that Lorinda was explaining to you guys about how to develop and understand the significant scenes in your case, right? Understand the story of what you're telling, understand the story of your case. But I like to write my theory in a narrative because that's the way I'm gonna be thinking about everything I do. So this is just an example. Layla was never abused by anyone. She made up the story about Mr. Alamond, the same story that she heard from her cousin after her mother caught her photographing her vagina. Her mother suggested that the explanation for her behavior was that her father touched her and she agreed. She saw this as an opportunity to get away from her house and her mother who had stopped being a true parent to her. And that's incorporating everything that we learned in the investigation of our case. This is a true case, this is an actual case. Okay. All right. Well in any time when you're getting ready to cross-examine or do the cross-examination, I mean, you know, everything that we've talked about, you do, but initially you develop, a, when you're getting ready for trial, you develop a list of the witnesses you, you will potentially have to cross-examine. And I mean, you can use the state subpoena list, you know, different investigative reports you have, any reports you have, um, and names of people and evidence that you receive. Just go through every name that you might come in contact with um, who you may potentially have to cross-examine. And then identify the role of each of those witnesses, meaning try to be familiar with their anticipated testimony through depositions and through your investigation. And then think what part, if any, of your defense theory does that testimony support? So you can think about how you're going to cross-examine a particular witnesses. If you've got a witness that supports a lot of your, your defensive theory, then the type of cross-examination you might want to do on that witness isn't a cross-examination that's going to discredit, right? Because this witness supports your defensive theory. You probably want to support that witness and highlight acts and factors that support your defensive theory. And then are the witnesses that you want to discredit? You look for that um, as well. Are there any witnesses that you want to ignore? Every trial I have, I always try to find a witness I don't want to cross-examine. Cross so in thinking about cross-examination, generally you want to think about it, as she said, as chapters. You know, chapters on topics based on the story you want to tell or chapters based on goals, goals you may want to achieve through witnesses. And you want to discuss these chapters and goals with each witness. You want to divide each witness's testimony into sections or chapters based on a part of a story or based on a goal you may want to obtain. And then know what, where the answers you are found in the evidence. In other words, sourcing. You want to know where the source of the answer is and the information you have. It's in deposition page line one or, or it's on police report page two. Wherever it is, you want to know where it is and, and categorize it. And then create an outline of the areas of cross-examination for each witness that you want um, and then know exactly where it is. And in this situation, in your context in particular, you want to be familiar with prior inconsistent statements and be ready to impeach. And most importantly, you want to relate the chapters to your theory of the defense. In other words, you don't want to just pick some stuff willy-nilly to cross-examine a witness on. You want to have it relate back to your theory of defense. If a cross-examination doesn't relate to your theory of the defense, then you may want to consider not doing it. 
You follow me? If it doesn't relate to your theory of defense, you may want to forego it as a, as a, a place to cross-examine. All right. So I just want to talk about chapters for a minute. So when I think about chapters, I think about like the, every chapter that I write, one, has to drive the theory of my case, and it's part of the story that I'm telling about this witness, that this witness is sharing information with the jury that they need to hear, and that story coming out in a way and in order that I want it. You get to control all of that. You get to control how you construct the chapters, and you get to control the order that you put them in. Um, so. The couple of things that I see a lot, one of the things that I do in my office a lot is that I'm, in essence, supervising serious trials in, the case, in my office as well as trying my own cases. But I do a lot of reviewing other people's prep. And the thing that I see more than anything is that people create chapters, and they're these very, very long, broad chapters. And what you want to do is break those chapters down into pretty small and discrete pieces. And each chapter should have a chapter heading that's a goal of what you are trying to accomplish through this set of questions. And if the, it's a goal question, right? So if you're trying to say, you are trying to show that the room that this took place in, could, this event could not have happened in this room because of the setup of this house, right? That may be a set of four chapters. It may be the first chapter is a layout of the whole household. And the second chapter is you're showing what this room looks like in relation to another room. And the third chapter may be um, what is going on in the household at that time of day. Right? It's a series of small, discrete goals that you set forth with a series of chapters of questions that lead you to that goal. You don't ask the goal question at the top of the page. Right? That's what you're trying to accomplish through the chapter. You never ask that question. But that chapter heading becomes your <coughs> argument for closing. So if you do a great job of writing out a cross-examination that has 25 chapters to it, small discrete chapters, when you are done and you're ready to close, you have your closing arguments because they are your chapter headings. Um, and so what you want to do is really break them down. Put one chapter on one page. Why? Well, this is what we do in our office. After you write all your chapters, you lay them out on the floor, and then you figure out what order you want to put them in. Right? Now, if you started your cross-examination with chapter one, and chapter one is a huge piece of impeachment, what is the lens through which you are presenting this witness to the jury? This person is a liar and cannot be believed about anything they say, right? Now, you may not want to do that in a sexual assault case with a child, because you don't yet have permission to impeach like that, right? So you may want to start your cross in a totally different place. So if chapter, let's say you plan it, that you're going to ask chapter one is this sort of attack. And you get up and you're like, oh my, she is sweet and small. And that was a crazy idea. Why did I think I was going to impeach first? You can take chapter one and just put it into chapter eight, if that's where you want it, and now you have a complete cross-examination in chapter form where you don't have to cross anything out or make arrows or remember to go back or do anything. So if you can keep every chapter on a page, and then it's in order, you have a lot more flexibility to change what you want to do when you get up there. Sometimes you don't know that you want to move that chapter till you're standing there, and you realize this is not the moment to do this, and you might want to move it. I think flexibility is a key in terms of uh, the, the chapter organization. But this gives you an example of breaking things down into chapters, right? This is an example of chapters and goals. For example, it might be the scene, the space, and, and your goal might be to show that it's a heavily trafficked area where it is, right? Another goal, and if you're looking at the scene or the space, might be to show that volume travels, that it's not a, a place that's isolated and sound. Those might be different goals that you might want to, to obtain. But you know, if you're looking at just storytelling, I mean, the space might be one. The way I organize my cross-examination is a little different, only because I don't really write out everything um, anymore. I used to uh, when I was a younger lawyer, but, but now I'm lazier, I guess, uh, and I don't write them out. Um, and so I, I kind of go that way. Old, and I still write it out. <laughs>
<laughs> so, so I don't write everything out anymore. I, I do write out what the scenes are, though. I do write out like an outline of the scenes, and I do my crosses based on that. I think it is wise, unless you're used to doing this and you do this a lot, um, to still write it all out. I think it's a great idea to still write it all out. It's very effective. It'll help you um, see things. And then another scene might be the prior relationship with the client. You know, how close you are to the person, meaning how close the witness is, the accuser is to the defendant. If it's a, if it's a stepfather, someone that she's not very close to, that can be a chapter that you want to explore with the witness. And others might be the details of the alleged sexual assault. More importantly, in an adult sexual assault case, I think that's an area you may want to explore, the details of what actually happened. If there's some issues that you may have about what's said, that could be a chapter. That's an area where you want to spend some time doing a cross-examination. A child, you might not want to talk about the sexual assault. And I think we talk about that later in another slide. Um, the motive to fabricate, that in and of itself could be an individual chapter. You know, if you've got some information, detailed information about a motive to fabricate, it could be a chapter for cross-examination. Parental influence, impeachment issues. If you have some specific ancillary, ancillary Impeachment issues can be different chapters you can use in cross-examination. All right, this is me breaking it down a little bit more, like some of the evidence that you can kind of marshal to talk about that and use on your cross-examination. So once you're dividing it up in chapters, you can think about other evidence that you can marshal and use for your cross-examination for the particular chapters. Photos, descriptions, statements from witnesses, these might be things you might be able to challenge a witness with when you're cross-examining on the scene. If the child comes in and you ask her, says, you know, this is, this is an area that's an open space, right? She says, no, it's pretty closed off. So what do you do then? You can and kind of say, well, your, your mom, these pictures, you can show the pictures, you can do different things to sort of develop your, your, your scene if you have to and do it in a general way. All right, and of course, I always go back to what about the scene supports your theory. All right. Order the chapters with intention, I think we covered that. Different types of cross-examination. So the type of cross-examination we all know is one of the types is a constructive cross-examination. If you've got a witness that helps your case, one of the things you might do is not come in trying to impeach or attack the witness or even be destructive in cross-examination. It's just look for and extract favorable points from an opposing witness. That's what a constructive cross-examination is. It's one that, that pulls out favorable points from an opposing witness. Uh, you start by asking what parts of the direct examination helps your client and ask questions about those parts. And then you also ask questions that corroborate parts of your theory. And then you seek helpful admissions from the witness. The type of cross-examination we routinely use, did you want to say anything on that, that constructive cross? Okay. The type we routinely see or that lawyers love is a destructive cross-examination, right? It's what's taught in law school. Um, it's, it's just pin them down, don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. You know, you, you say things for final argument. You look for yes answers only, you know, and then you use Irvin Unger's 10 um, commandments of cross-examination, be brief. You guys are familiar with these, right? Anybody not seen this? But that's the destructive cross-examination, the one we routinely do where we're trying to tell the witness, where we're trying to kill the witness and maim the witness. And then there's a lawyer accreditation cross. Anybody heard of that, the lawyer accreditation cross? I'm finding that more that most people haven't heard of this. There's a guy named Jim McElhaney who, who is, is sort of the creator of the lawyer accreditation cross. Um, when I was a prosecutor, I lost my first four cases, my first four trials, and I was really worried. And then there was a lawyer named Shirley Durham who wasn't respected by anybody in the office um, who asked me, could she help me with, one of her with my trial? And Shirley helped me with my trial, and I won like 19 or 20 trials in a row using the methods that Shirley used, and Shirley did this, the lawyer accreditation cross. She used every cross-examination as an opportunity to build her credibility, to build her likability. She spent her time cultivating credibility and likability with the jury. And the accreditation cross, according to McElhaney, is basically a cross-examination where you're just trying to build credibility. You're not really even worried so much about the story. You want the jury to know that you're the truthful person in the courtroom. And aspects of the lawyer accreditation uh, cross-examination can be used. You know, the idea is that when you're finished with cross-examination, you want the jury to think you're careful, you're fair, you're honest. The whole way you're doing your cross-examination cross is just to build your credibility. And that's the lawyer accreditation cross-examination. Can be very effective. There's some lawyers that they do that only in their trials and they're very successful. And then, of course, the storytelling cross-examination. It views every part of the trial like it's simply another part of the trial to tell your story or your theory. 
through questions. I mean, every witness that comes in, you're looking for aspects of their testimony that supports your theory of the case, and you're just doing it in a storytelling fashion. And you know, the easy way to look at it, you use declarative st st statements to advance the story or theory of the case. You, each one contains one fact, one thought. Not long, but just real simple. And I think the, the best example I see of it is the Jack and Jill story, right? There was a boy named Jack, true? And there was a girl named Jill, right? And they both saw hell. You know, just one fact at a time telling the story. You know, and it, it works with every type of case is a storytelling cross-examination. And then the soft a compassionate cross, which um, some argue was in existence before Jerry Spence, but he kind of made it famous, the soft, a compassionate cross-examination. And uh, it's a cross-examination where you, you kind of, um, you know, you, you kind of view things, you view the witnesses like onions, and you try to peel back layers of witnesses, right? Or you find a universal truth that applies to the witness, and then you juxtapose that truth against the witness's testimony. Um, Another example of it, and there's an example of the snitch, but a child's witness could also be an example, or have an example of it. A universal truth might be you love your mother, right? Most children love their mothers. And so you, you, you ask the child a soft cross-examination, might, it might look something like you love your mother. You, you want your mother to be treated well, isn't that right? I do. You, you care about your mother? I do. And, and, and ma'am, your mother is the most important person to you. Mr. Darrow, my client, he argued with your mother. True? He did. He didn't make your mother feel real good. He didn't. Since he's been gone, your mother's feeling pretty good. He's much happier. Yeah. And you kind of get the idea of, of the soft cross-examination. Universal truth. You confront him with the universal truth. Most children love their mothers. Not all, but most children love their mothers. Children love their mothers, which is a universal truth that most people will accept. You confront the witness with it, and then your cross-examination follows, which is a soft, compassionate cross-examination. And you have to be a little creative in terms of thinking of ways it can apply. Another way of looking at a witness like a lair, um, it's something you can do with just about every witness. I don't want to run out of time. All right. I just want to say that I think every cross-examination, like you should have like a, think about it like a bag of tricks, right? It's like a bag of stuff that you use in moments when you need it. And every single one of those techniques should all be in there, right? It's not like, oh, I'm always crossing as a storyteller or cross-examiner, right? You should be able to take those things and merge them together into styles that work for you, that, that, are, that are workable for you, and there are different witnesses in different moments where you're gonna use those, and maybe use them conjunctively, like as together um, for an effective cross. Um, so before you get up and cross a child in particular, you really wanna think about your tone, you really wanna, and with an adult witness, frankly, in a, a rape case as well, right? I mean, you want to think about how am I going to approach this witness? And what I said before, which again, you guys have the benefit of having perhaps deposed this witness, knowing what the what the witness presents as. And you want, you're going to have a sense of what kind of tone you want to approach the witness with. And I don't know if you have the leeway to do this, but if you have, um, if you are a six foot, foot tall man, or even a normal sized, grown sized woman, and you're cross examining a six year old, you might want to bring a chair over and just sit across from the witness instead of appearing so dominant and powerful over a child in the courtroom. Um, you may have a lot more ability to get the child to share information with you and you don't seem so commanding in that space. So you wanna think about like, what is your tone, what is the appropriate tone for you to approach this witness with, and have a plan about it. Um, it's, it is, this can change the entire way in which your cross-examination goes, is how you present. Um, so I don't know if you can see the face of the witness in the picture. Um, I feel like she's got the wrong tone <laughs> because this witness looks like she's crying and is miserable. And I don't know that that, I mean, I don't know, but that is probably not the space where I would want to be if this was a witness who was testifying um, in a sexual assault case. Um, so you really want to think about that. Um, 
Oh, the other thing is if you are cross-examining a seven-year-old kid and you are not a parent and you don't have a younger sibling and you have no idea what this particular witness presents like, spend some time with a seven-year-old. I mean, actually, or read some books about kind of like the maturity and the stage at which, which this child is going to be and their comprehension level and the language that they use, the kind of vocabulary that they use. Because you could be asking questions up here and the child is here and you're totally missing each other because you're not relating to the child in uh, a way that they can comprehend where you are. I also would strongly urge you not to pander to a child. Um, I've seen um, people lecture on this and like talk to a six-year-old like they're two, um, and you just look inappropriate, like you're not really getting at where the child is at. And so I think you have to really strike some good sort of level um, emotional space. For me, I, I feel like, oh, we also, we talked about this a little bit too. It also depends on who you are, right? Like so I might approach crossing a kid totally differently than Eric is going to, Right? We're not the same person. So we're even if it's the same kid we were both cross-examining, we're probably going to approach it very differently because of who we are. So you need to incorporate all of that. Who the witness is, who you are, and how you think it would work in this case. Um, so I just think those, those things are really important. I also just is an, an interesting example. We had a case in our office where the there was a mistrial at the end of the trial. Okay, so the child testified in the case, and she was maybe nine or 10 years old at the time she testified about the events that had taken place maybe two years earlier. And when she testified, she was still pretty young, and she was compliant and um, extremely compliant during the cross-examination. It was a hung jury. The case got retried two or three years later. The kid that came into that courtroom was now 13 years old. Same or different witness than the 10 or nine year old. Totally different kid, right? And for those of you who have teenagers or have had teenagers, you know that, right? Your totally sweet, nice nine year old kid, when they're 13, they're not nice and sweet anymore, right? So the kid was totally different. And she was like responding back and talking back and really aggressive. And it was a it was a total disaster, and there was a conviction in this, after the second trial. And I have to say that it was the lawyers had not really comprehended how different the witness was, was going to be when she came into the courtroom a couple of years later. So it really can change everything. And I think, for example, we talk, I talked a little bit about the lawyer accreditation method. The lawyer accreditation method would take advantage of that as an opportunity to increase the lawyer's credibility by varying the tone. For example, if you've got a lawyer who during a trial is just aggressively going after a bunch of different witnesses, and when a child hits the stand, that lawyer dials it way back. And he's now, instead of being very aggressive, he's very gentle with the child. Still asking probing questions now, but being very gentle, being very thoughtful, and being very concerned about the child. His credibility goes through the roof with, roof with the jury, right? As opposed to a lawyer who just knows one speed. And there are lawyers who I know who, who don't care about tone, and they'll prepare a jury in voir dire. Uh, you, know, you want a lawyer to be aggressive. You don't mind if, how you feel about me being aggressive with a child? They go through all of that, and they get a commitment in voir dire about being aggressive with a child. But I think when they ignore the tone, they lose credibility. A jury may tell you that in voir dire, but when they see this, this lawyer aggressively going after a child who's alleging child abuse, I think it, it sends the wrong signal and you could lose a jury on a cross-examination like that. Whereas the opposite, if your, your tone is adjusted and you're cognizant of your tone, you can gain credibility with the jury at that point. Now that I'm looking at this picture, the judge looks like she thinks her tone is wrong too. <laughs> judge looks like she got a tone, you know? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Confidence um, in testimony? Yeah. I mean, just quickly, if in your jurisdiction you are allowed to challenge the competence of a child witness, if you think there is a basis to suggest that she or he does not, um, cannot comprehend the difference between telling a truth and telling a lie, um, you can file a motion to have. Uh, um, 
some sort of inquiry about whether or not the child is you competent. You generally file a motion to have the child examined, basically, about that. You can at least attempt to. Um, or you can bring an expert. If you've got, for example, a video recording of a child and it appears on the video recording that the child doesn't appreciate that initial question from a forensic examiner, then that may be a good point to use an expert, te expert testimony to challenge the competency of the child. I've done that in a, in a case before where we had a four-year-old complainant where, and our expert opined that she was not competent. But we had an advantage in the since that the client's sister was the mother of the child. And so she was very accessible. She made the child accessible to us and everything. And so we were able to have her examined and have an expert actually testify about the competency of the child. But you know, just know that a child is presumed to be competent unless you show otherwise. Yeah, in New York, in New York there's actually an age, an, an age range. Um, and so if the child is under nine years old, they're not presumed to be competent, and mm. then it, you, know, you can then file a motion and all that. But here, you can do it in, in, in a case when you think that that's true of a child. So it could be a child that's a, older, but has other issues and may present as not being competent. Mm -hmm. um, the, if the child's gonna testify by closed circuit TV, you want to, you're going to know that in advance because there's, probably, there's a motion being filed, but you want to think about how you're going to cross through a, a TV screen, <laughs> which is totally different than having a kid in front of you. Yeah, I don't know how you guys do it, but usually when we have a child testifying by closed circuit TV, everybody except the defendant is outside of the courtroom. I mean, you're in a room with the child, with the judge, and it's being recorded, and the jury and the defendant are in a different room watching the testimony happen. And so when, when that usually happens, you usually start filling out the plea paperwork because it's, it's a disaster for a defendant. Um, it's a disaster. I mean, they're thinking that this, this child is so afraid of this guy that he can't even be in the same room with the defendant. And so usually it's a disastrous thing. So something to fight at all costs if you can, if there's ever a mention of your child testifying by closed circuit TV. There's a whole bunch of Supreme Court cases says that if certain requirements are met, they can do it. I had a case where a child passed out before coming into the room with my client. I think you have to make it for purposes of appeal. You've got to object to it. Even if there's some law saying that it is, it doesn't mean that the court you're going to get is going to agree with that law. You may have a situation where you're able to make new law or maybe carve out some type of an exception. So you still got to make the objection to preserve the, the, the issue for appeal. But what I find that is, is that most judges on the trial court level, if they've got some evidence that this is going to harm the child, most of them are going to take that chance. And they're going to let the child testify by closed circuit TV. Like I said, in the case I had, the child passed out before coming into the courtroom. And so the judge was concerned that the state had the child immediately examined by a, a psychologist, and that psychologist opined that it would cause her damage to come in and testify to face the defendant. And then they wanted to do the closed circuit TV, and my client wanted to take the deal at that point, at that point, mid-trial. <laughs> Oh my God. The, now, the deal was probation mid trial. He was being offered 20 years before trial, and they offered him a probation before the child testified. Take that. <laughs> I was under the impression that, that he was going to win because the child wasn't going to say what the state wanted him to say. That's what I thought. But, but nevertheless, um, it, it happened. And I think it's a dangerous thing. You've got to avoid it when you can. I mean, the threshold is pretty high. They do have to show that there's some sort of emotional harm that could come to the child for testifying. And I mean, the, I've only had that um, happen once in, in, my, in any of my cases. And um, the notes that they then had to turn over from the psychiatrist were really helpful to us. And then the prosecutor didn't want to call all the doctor, it was actually ended up being sort of helpful. So litigating it can actually, you know, y yield some helpful things for you. Yeah, you get a hearing. We had a hearing. You'll get a hearing. Yeah, you could we argue were granted for a hearing. hearing too. Yeah. Um, okay, how are we doing? Are we are we out of time? How are we good? Five minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we want to just talk a little bit about um, some techniques to use for crossing specific kinds of witnesses that come in in these cases, um, and you know what you can expect uh, when you have a difficult witness like that. Um, so. The first witness is, oh, before we said that, before we even go there, I have like two ideas about what I think you should always think about when you have a witness that is like a little scary. And the first is from my good friend Sam Dennis from Valdosta, Georgia, who says, you cannot control a witness until you can control yourself. And that's where we started with, with Joe Pesci, which is I feel like he kind of lost it a little bit. Um, and so you need to be able to control your own emotions before you can control the witness. So if you can keep yourself in check and keep yourself together, then you have a far greater likelihood of being able to control the witness. And the other thing is I try to envision 
this kind of all the time when I'm on trial, and it really helps me when I'm crossing a witness, which is to envision that the theory of my case is here. It's literally this thing that's like floating around over my head all the time, and that everything that I'm doing, I'm like, pulling and making sure that it's like feeding into my theory. And if you can hold the theory, you can kind of hold your composure with the witness. Um, so if you have a witness that's crying, let the witness cry. Like just wait, wait it out. I promise the person will stop crying <laughs> eventually. You don't have to say, you don't have to say um, would you like a break? Right? Um, sometimes the judge intervenes and does that for you, and then you, it's out of your control. But my suggestion is just wait. Just like give the person a moment, let them cry, take a deep breath, wait. And when you see that the witness is ready, start your cross examination again. You might want to, like, do you see what I just did? I am signaling to the witness that what? I'm going to start asking you some more questions now. I haven't said a word, right? That's it. That's all you need to do. Um, OK, so the, <laughs> the angry witness. Eric put that slide in there <laughs> to make us all laugh. Um, so the angry witness, you know, um, I tried a case with, um, there were two victims. They were both women from England who had um, claimed that my client drugged them at Pasha, which is a big club in New York City um, where there's a lot of drugs and a lot of drinking going on. And it was during Fleet Week. <laughs> Do you guys know what Fleet Week is? OK. Um, and they alleged that my client drugged them, threw them somehow into a cab, brought them to the Bronx, and raped them both simultaneously at knife point um, in his apartment. And um, there were two witnesses. Now, I cross-examined the first woman, and she was, um, just flip the next slide for one second. Mm -hmm. Totally flatlined, like seriously, like unemotional, just sat there, was like, <laughs> To me, inside, I'm dying because she seemed totally traumatized, but like completely flatlined. And then the other witness was really angry and nasty, and my co-counsel cross-examined her. And I have to say, that cross of the angry witness was so much more interesting and fun to watch. <laughs> Because um, she was fighting back with him, and um, she seemed really angry, and he was able to sort of use and channel the anger, um, because of course anger was involved in our case on some level, because the witnesses were claiming that our client robbed them, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so it actually kind of worked to our favor. So when it comes to an angry witness, it's like just channel it and use it and figure out how it's fitting into your theory, because it likely will fit into your theory somewhere. The flatline witness um, is hard because you have to generate the emotion. The emotion is not coming from the witness. Um, so you want to think about what kind of emotion you want to generate. Um, what's interesting to me about the sort of flatline witness is I think we all probably know that often people who actually have been sexually abused are often traumatized and don't emote. But jurors don't think that. They think that a witness who is alleging that they've been abused is going to be crying or upset or emotional somehow. And often, a witness who does not show emotion is disbelieved by jurors, which is interesting. Yeah, I think the flat effect, you know, flat effect from a witness. You know, sometimes the angry witness oftentimes can make many mistakes in their testimony. And if you're calm, you can kind of point out a lot of that, different mistakes that may come out from the witness in terms of inconsistencies and, and you know, testimony just not being on point. And the flat witness, the witness with the flat effect, I agree, isn't often believed by, by jurors. And so sometimes if you're able to stick to a cohesive theory and stick to the story in your cross-examination, you can score a lot of points with the disinterested or the unemotional witness. I try to think about for myself just like a little bit of a like serious, um, competent, very professional, almost like a teacher kind of affect when I'm cross-examining a woman in a sexual assault case. 
Like it's almost like I don't want to show too much emotion um, unless it calls for it, but my sort of starting place, it's not being really soft and sweet and kind. It's kind of like very competent, totally professional, and just asking the things that I need to ask. And, and then, then I take it from there as my starting place. I think it's beautiful you said starting place because oftentimes your cross-examination and your affect has to be dynamic as well. Right. Meaning it has to be changing. You might start off very calmly and, and, and as the, the answers come in or the attitude you get from a witness, you may want to change your affect. The witness may give you permission to kill the witness at some point. Um, so in the last one is like the runaway witness, the witness who can't stop talking. Right? You've asked a very clean, leading cross-examination question, like from our little case problem that we're going to go work on now. Um, Rebecca, you smoked a cigarette with Juan. It's a good, clean cross-examination question, right? It's a leading, not a lot of facts. I didn't tag it. We didn't talk about tags, right? But I didn't Rebecca. really. Well, I didn't really smoke a cigarette with him. You know, he had a cigarette, and we were sitting in the car with each other for the cigarette and everything like that. But I didn't really smoke the cigarette with him. I don't think. Rebecca, you smoked a cigarette with Juan. He was offering me a cigarette, but I didn't know him that well. I don't know him like that. He had that cigarette. I didn't know what was in that cigarette. If it was dipped with PCP or marijuana or something. But, but he had a cigarette, but I didn't try to smoke the cigarette with him. I wasn't smoking no drugs or anything on that night. You smoked a cigarette with Juan. He had a cigarette, and I might have put it in my lips. And I might have puffed on it, but I didn't inhale. So, Rebecca, you're... So <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, you're saying you didn't smoke a cigarette with Juan? I don't remember smoking a cigarette. <laughs> okay, so you can repeat, right? Say your question, repeat it verbatim. Um, you can turn your back on the witness and just let them talk because you're signaling to the jury like, I don't really care that you're yapping. I'm just gonna be back in a minute. You could sit down at your counsel table, sit, wait till they're done. Um, you can shorten your question. Um, or you can invert your question. Um, sometimes I say, my question is, before I repeat it. But that's sort of stylistic. Um, so that's the way to deal with the runaway witness. Um, oh, so yeah, it's our last few slides. Oh, so the big question, <laughs> these are some questions that we had. We One had was, some should questions. you impeach the, the witness in, in ending? Um, you know, I guess it depends on your theory on whether or not you, you should impeach a witness, depending on the situation. If it's a situation where the witness is offering information that's helpful to your theory, and you know that there may be some other testimony that's out there, you may not want to impeach the witness. It can depend on the age of the kid. Um, it can depend on um, whether or not there's not a lot of specificity or whether or not um, the child can really uh, communicate well. I mean, so in deciding whether or not impeach is a, is a question that you ought to look at very carefully. This is, this is a question that's asked all the time of me, and I would say you want to even try to play that impeachment out, like with a colleague, right? Because you want to see how that's going to go. So often, jurors are so forgiving of kids for saying something different at different times. And so, if you're, you know, like you don't want to impeach a kid on, like, you said it happened on Friday, but it was really Thursday. Like, who cares, right? Like, kids make mistakes like that all the time. And the jurors are just going to get mad at you for trying to suggest a kid is lying about some small thing. But if it's like a really big thing, and it's like, oh, you said he put his penis in your vagina as opposed to your mouth, you probably want to impeach on that. So it's like important to really assess the and, dynamics. And, and in your jurisdiction, it's probably safer to impeach because you've got a deposition, a prior inconsistent statement. And depending on the fact of impeachment, in other words, if you, like I said, if you got a, a kid that has maybe eight different inconsistencies and those amount to something, then maybe you think about, about impeaching. One of the things that, that I, I think is important is to also think about how you're going to prove up the impeachment. If you're able to prove up the impeachment immediately, like with a deposition, it's much more effective than bringing in other witnesses to prove up an impeaching statement. For example, the child may have said something to a teacher, and you know she said that, and you confront her with a statement to a teacher. And then three witnesses later, you're bringing in the to the teacher to talk about the impeaching statement. I think that's less effective and probably not impeachment that you'd want to pursue unless the statement was just something mind-blowing or something right. really dynamic to the case. And also, you just want to go back to your credibility cross, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you end up just looking like a bully and you're not really 
gaining anything, you may not want to do the impeachment anyway, even if it feels like it's important. So you really have to figure that out based on who the witness is. So the bottom line is that it's not automatic in terms of impeaching a witness. I know most people say, well, I got all these inconsistent statements that the child's make. It's not always automatic that you want to use all those impeaching statements. So we presented just like a, a list of different types of impeachment, you know, and I know you all are familiar with them. We're not going to go into detail. This prior inconsistent statement, prior conviction of a crime, you'll see that more in adult uh, sexual assault victims with them um, as opposed to with children. There may be some children who, who have some prior convictions, but most juvenile convictions aren't admissible, so you're probably not going to have that with children. But you'll have it with adult victims potentially. And then showing bias, interest, and motive, that's the way you can impeach any witness. And then reputation or opinion for truthfulness, you know, which is, I think, the most underutilized method of impeaching child victims that there is. Just imagine if you send an investigator out to a child's school and you talk to teachers and you talk to different people and you get um, information that you can use to impeach the child. That, that's powerful to use in the case. And I'm being told that we're out of time. And so that pretty much kind of uh, sums up some of the questions that we ask. Thank you.